First of all, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak here. And I changed my presentation completely based on yesterday's and today's talk. I hope I can adapt to I hope I can adapt to the high level and also to some questions and conversations uh, I've had uh, yesterday and, and today. Just to hope there's something in it, in it for you as well. Um, so the session is about standardization, and I'm going to talk about standardization with dedicated preclinical imaging. So why is dedica a dedicated technology uh, so important? And then, of course, it depends on, on the species, obviously. But the whole point is about translation. Now, there are a lot of similarities between, let's say, mouse and man, but there are also key differences. So in terms of standardization, I think the clinic will lead the way with the understanding that the animal is different. So there are things you can do, things you can't do, things you do slightly differently. Now, dedicated imaging technology is not only about the heart. And that's a little bit of a, a commercial slide in there. Um, because one setup with hard and software can be used for multiple different applications. And I think that all ties into uh, the following slides. When we talk about cardiovascular imaging, the field of cardiovascular goes far beyond a left ventricle, as you all know. Um, good example is if something is very important to me, then it's very close to my heart. The heart is the center. A therapeutic drug in oncology cannot reach the tumor if the heart doesn't pump well. Uh, the drug itself will do different things to the heart, as we had our talks on, on toxicity. So whenever talking about cardiac research, I think that blood vessels are included, toxicology is included, but all the other fields, in one way or another, are related to cardiovascular. So it's a little bit about interdisciplinary with the heart and the vascular system at the center. So there's really a lot you can do on a small thing such as a mouse heart. We're talking on 1.2 centimeters in length, roughly. So starting from uh, drug delivery or inducing ischemia with skipping surgery, looking at regurgitation, so valve insufficiencies, uh, myocardial perfusion, oxygenation, and I'll have a few, uh, a few slides on these in the presentation. So, but when talking about standardization, I think it's a very good conversation to have. It's a necessary conversation to have, and it's fantastic we are actually able to have this conversation. When you think about, like, let's say, roughly 15 years, when say, like, okay, let's look at a mouse heart with ultrasound, and it's like, it's crazy, it doesn't really work. To this day, it's like, Sometimes I give a seminar or talk to people uh, with a cup of coffee in the hand, and it's like, yeah, when you look at the mouse heart, it's like 55 megahertz, and they're like, no, nah, it doesn't exist. Yes, it does. So it has come a very long way in the last 15 years, and because it's so widely accepted, and I, I think you're the best example, all the, com all the presentations of what, what is possible on the ultrasound, really allows now to focus and move into reproducibility and standardization. Um, why is that important? And as um, a review from, from last year, Matula methods, the section that usually is cropped the most because of space limitations in the paper. So you read something, you think it's fantastic, this is brilliant, you want to do it yourself, and it just doesn't work. Things like not mentioning what kind of anesthesia is used. And we have several talks like how important the level of anesthesia, the induction phase is, body temperature, gender not telling if it's male or female, what age, etc. These are really key things. So when we talk about standardization, I think it's not only the imaging technology or the image acquisition itself, but so much more around it. So, and I have a little bit on that. So first of all, one needs to provide reproducible metadata. And metadata is important data but it's not, let's say, fraction shortening, ejection fraction, it's everything behind it. Make the data accessible. Someone else will want to reanalyze your data. What if they don't have your dedicated software? It should still be made available, and some funding bodies are really on that, onto that. Um, 
it's great, you have done your data, your PhD student, your postdoc has done the data, they leave, and a year later you need to go back, and it's like there's no way you find it. So all of these needs to be taken into uh, consideration. So I have a long list of questions, um, open for discussion, um, but I'm also trying to offer a little bit of, of solutions. So sometimes it's okay, you start an experiment, which species should you start with, then which, which strain, and we've had um, a presentation showing also that the substrain is important. You can have a black six, and there are different substrains. Some will respond to therapy, some will show a phenotype, others will not. So it's really important. Um, which sex does the animal have? What age is it? Um, all of those things do play an important role. And ultrasound really allows you to do a lot of different things, meaning different species. Um, small as a zebrafish, uh, congenital heart disease on the non-human primate uh, has been used. Newts are fantastic models simply because the heart completely regenerates. So for the zebrafish, for example, but also this is a P2. Um, you could do a P1, fresh mouse. Their heart tissue completely regenerates if you do an impartial. So they still have com complete stem cell capabilities. And there's a lot of research going on in that. So you'd need dedicated, real-time, non-invasive modalities for doing that. Pardon? <laughs> uh, it's my, one of my favorites because I'm, I'm <laughs> optimal. So like, okay, I said, let's scan the heart. And the researcher looks at me and says, which one? It has three, I didn't know. Um, <laughs> so uh, I was standing a little bit like an idiot. But um, why octopus? Octopus was part of a cost action. There is, you could, until recently, take an octopus, play baseball with it, and no one can do anything to you because it's like, it's like muscles. It's, yeah. There's no ethical protocol. There's research done, there's aquaculture for tissue regeneration, but no one knows what kind of anesthesia is actually needed to do, let's say, research on that, on aquaculture. So what anesthesia we found, which anesthesia was seemingly making the octopus sleep, but it actually didn't. It actually made it slowly die because of muscle, uh, uh, muscle relaxation. All of these things. So it was part of a, a European Union project on standardizing and establishing well animal welfare based on cardiovascular function. Um, so it's very versatile, and the beauty of um, octopus, zebrafish, they are in water, so you don't need gel. Just dip the transducer and you're good to go. Um, so zebrafish, very small, and until recently it was like, yeah, no, can't do it. Um, yes, you can. The pigment are not an issue because of the ultrasound. You can do systolic function, diastolic function, and it's all very nicely published. And they are really small. So this is a little 3D scan that I did um, just to show fish nicely embedded in a groove so it doesn't float away. Put it in water with uh, an aesthetic in it, it flips around, goes there, you do your scanning, you put it in fresh water, off it goes. Pretty neat. So a lot of um, phenotyping, because it's so easy to man manipulate, is happening on the zebrafish, and it's also in a field that is uh, increasing in cardi cardiac research. Besides defining the species, there's a lot of conversation one needs to have about experimental conditions. And experimental conditions still have nothing to do with the actual imaging and what to analyze, but how you treat your animal. Um, I know it's redundant, and I'm repeating what the previous speakers already mentioned, but it's really, really important. Body temperature, heart rate, how you position the animal, and there's actually a difference between North America and Europe. Um, Anesthesia type, anesthesia levels, all of these things do play an important role, but you will not find that in material methods. And that's why all of this is as important part of, of a consensus. So the European Union is heavily looking into that for the grants from uh, 2021. It's going to be required. A lot of um, journals and other funding bodies like the NIH Gates Foundation are onto that and require that, they require metadata. You can no longer submit, or it's required that whenever you submit and you, get pub you are allowed to say that's considered good, publish. Anything behind the scenes needs to be accompanied. Heart rate, body temperature, strain, age, uh, subtype of the strain, all of this, so people can look at the data and reproduce it. Also, 
data accessibility. You need to be able to find it in the future. You need to be able to share the data, meaning all the data. So you report the stroke volume doesn't change. Fantastic. Or it goes up, it goes down. But stroke volume is a result of diastolic volume minus systolic volume. So that information needs to be put into supplemental material. Um, because let's say you have a hypertrophic heart. The heart keeps pumping the same thing, but you have a huge balloon as compared to regular heart. That's information that you may miss if you only look at stroke volume. So that was um, most likely coming as a requirement. And also to have accessible data. So and that accessible data, not limited to proprietary software. So if you have a Vivo system, you publish it, you analyze everything on the Vivo lab, there should be an option for someone who does not have the offline software to look at the data and do measurement. And the Vivo technology allows pretty much all of the future requirements. Standardizing, working with presets, keeping all the settings constant, working in an imaging station, removing the user from the equation. Monitoring heart rate, respiration rate, um, getting the body temperature in, the, it, all of the information embedded with the image or in some way linked to the image. Um, controlling anesthesia, all of this can be put into the information for every single animal. For clinical ultrasound, you have your, your patient management page or your worksheet. The same you do on the small animals, irrespective of which species. Also, the sharing of the data. Movies, bitmaps, you can work with, uh, with DICOM readers, you can do MATLAB processing, image data, so you can do also more in terms of data analysis. Mm -hmm. Um, data management, how to find your data in a year from now, or people leave, come and go. There is a way of, you have all the measurements, everything is done, you export it to a cloud, individual and secure accounts, obviously. Um, and then you say like, oh, wait a minute, the black six mice that were, because you have the metadata, they were 12 weeks, I want to look into systolic function, my systolic volume, diastolic volume, ejection fraction, fraction shortening, and I want to compare it now to my valve C that I have, done last month. Click, 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 they are plotted. So helping you to work with data in the long run. Now, all of this helps in standardizing, but there's more that needs to be done. And then it's about imaging parameters. How many parameters do you need? Do you need to compare groups? Disease versus control? Are you reporting change from baseline, for example? Are you doing a resting anesthetic echo, or do you give a stress test to, sheet to see how good is the heart in actually coping with something? Because when the animal is sleeping, everything is, may look nice, but stressing it may change things. Um, one of zebrafish phenotyping studies, they couldn't find anything. They let the fish swim, and suddenly whoop, the cardiac parameters were complete day and night, <coughs> simply because the stress changed everything. Um, and also, of course, there are pressure volume loops with echo. So you can get the volume information from the ultrasound, the pressure from your pressure catheter, and create then your volume loops. And on the ultrasound guidance, you also know exactly where you place the catheter. Now, um, detail you can see. And I could tell you, like, there's a 30 or for my, let's say, 40 micrometer resolution. The number sounds fantastic. but. It's still, I find, if I show a coronary artery, mixed click, it's like, wow, that's a coronary artery in the mouth, that's really nice. Um, so that's the level of detail that you can get. Um, the coronary artery, well, it's a blood vessel. So sometimes I get the questions like, yeah, it's a cardiac disease, but actually is it a result because the heart is not doing well or is something happening in the periphery? And that's why you link cardiovascular and uh, be it you have uh, aortic aneurysms, you have thrombosis formation, uh, or atherosclerosis, and I have a little bit on, on atherosclerosis, because that will change the heart. You treat the heart, the disease keeps on going. So you can do it on a mouse, for example. This is something I did quite some time ago with the company. Uh, looking, this is a mouse aortic arch. So here from the aortic valve, you see the open and closing. There's the arch, and we find abnormal structures, and you know if it's abnormal, if you've done two, three healthy aortic arches, to see plaque formation. 
you will always find them on the inner curve, not on the outer because they have much more uh, low velocities. And you can look into the plug, you can assess the plug size, quantify it in 2D, 3D, latest also now 4D, um, to see like how much is it constricting, and if something happens on the heart, you have a reason why. So linking them, and when we talk about plug formation, it's always important to know it correlates to histology. And it's a very nice study done in, in uh, Gothenburg by Sarah Sedlund and, and Li Ming Yang. They looked with their A4E mice and found that uh, <coughs> the longitudinal motion is correlating to plug burden in the A4E mice. And it was like, that's interesting. So they did the same on the patients. And they found longitudinal wall motion is correlating to plug burden. Mm -hmm. So this could help in early detection of arthrosclerotic disease before you actually see the plug, because arthrosclerosis is a systemic inflammatory disease, and plug formation will happen where you have the inflammation and turbulent flow, which is not always the case, but still you will see changes in the vascularity. And that you can also go on bigger animals. This is something I did on uh, it's abdominal aorta, it's an aneurysm model, that's a rabbit. So <coughs> rabbit wall here, in terms of resolution, you see the bowel here, you see the lily moving, and that's then the abdominal aorta. This is also taken forward to the clinic, and I hope that during the break later on you'll have a look the system as well because some data already indicates that peripheral artery disease detected with the frequencies that we used for used to from the animal can be linked to cardiac disease in the human as well. And that takes me to the next step, cardiac disease. So there are multiple ways of looking into systolic function. Which is the right way? Should we use the M mode, a combination of Doppler and 2D? How about a 4D slide? What's the value? How much more do you get out of it? And one can have a very long conversation about this, but I think the bottom, bottom line is the disease model may just determine and take the answer for you. And sometimes you can do less with the same result as when you do more, but sometimes you just need to add more data and do put more work in it um, to get some reliable information. So different ways of doing it is Doing it means assessing systolic function is the M mode. The M mode, as you all know, is very quick, it's reliable, and it's very robust. It has been around since ages. The first uh, use of cardiac ultrasound was the M mode with the Teichholz formula. And um, the scanning, let's put it that way the way I teach the scanning on, on, let's say, on a mouse or on a rat is slightly different from a clinical approach. Um, Clinically, you go straight to a short axis, because, I mean, you have the papillary muscles, these are the perfect landmarks, spot on, and it's very reproducible. I find that for the small animals, I prefer to have a long axis first. And then when the long axis, the center of the ventricle is in the center of the screen, and with the imaging station, I just rotate 90 degrees, and that's my reproduce it to short axis. I do not assume that I expect to see a round short axis, because if it's round, it's good. If it's ellipsoid, well, I defined the shape of the heart from the long axis already, and then there's a heart is misshapen because of a disease. Also, um, especially for mice, um, the papillary muscle is affected by disease. And to me, if something is affected by the disease, it's a landmark, but not a position marker. It guides me. And that's why I sometimes do not go mid-papillary, but I go mid-ventricular, and the papillary muscle is then excluded. But these are different, different techniques, and just me mentioning it means it's not a full standard, and I'm happy to learn more whether this approach of going mid-ventricular makes sense or whether mid-papillary is just as good and it will work. But overall, when you look in the M mode, the analysis is very reproducible, so almost no inter and intra user variability. But the reason why I put that slide, and I should just, just mention it, but it's a very nice paper in looking at the effect of anesthesia on your data. So anesthesia time versus anesthesia level. And the bottom line is, and we've had that several times in the talks, high heart rate is the key. I personally know referees who will send preclinical imaging data if their, heart, if their heart rate is too low. Because they can actually say from that heart rate, this is the animal's temperature. Animal's temperature is too low, you can't do the imaging. So something to keep in mind. 
for the long axis, and I, I put this in because sometimes I get questions from when um, someone gets a manuscript back and it's like, oh, please, the referee doesn't believe I can do mouse echo. Um, it's because different scanning techniques. Typical long axis on a, on a human heart would be an AP review, right? So the referee's main comment is like, whoa, 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 mouse, long axis, apical foreshortening, you can't tell how long the heart actually is. Thing is, yes, you can if you scan the animal like you're supposed to scan an animal. The heart is smaller than the transducer, so you can literally go along it. You play in slow motion, make sure the apex is what we call it, like stable, it's not moving too much, not shortening too much, and then you have a reproducibility. So that's why I think the clinic will lead the way but clinicians also need to understand that there may be different scanning techniques from the top mouse to man. So that's one way of standardizing, really making sure, looking at the picture in slow motion before you save and before you commit it for data analysis. Another way of standardizing is through data analysis. Data analysis through automated data analysis. And this is going to be, uh, this is already available, this is coming very soon. Once you have your image, you click a button, the computer will do the rest for you based on machine, machine learning algorithms. The key is the computer will do it for you, but you as a user will still review the data. It's not a closed box. You get the data out and that's it. You can still monitor and double check that the tracing is done well enough, but it will save you time and guide you along the way. Also, different way of standardizing is um, how to randomize. Uh, as an example, I have here um, transaortic constriction. We had some talks on, on hypertrophy, so I put that one in. Um, you make a banding on the aorta between the nominate and the common carotid, and you can literally you can measure the flow through the stenosis. So you could, if you wanted to, randomize based on the stenotic flow, and then draw conclusions afterwards. That means change from baseline, but also figuring out what's the state of disease, how is the animal doing after my surgery before moving on rather than randomizing blindly. So you have the option to do that. And then as the heart is growing, you can then link it to the baseline and find, maybe find out who may respond and who may not respond. And also looking into the valve uh, insufficiencies, regurgitation flow, when the valve can't close properly and you have the jets going back. Very briefly, and because uh, we've had the talks before, um, <coughs> just don't forget diastolic function. Too many papers or projects report that fraction shortening is improving or is not changing, but the diastole is forgotten. So also filling is as important as pumping. Um, left ventricle, how about the right? Um, so the right ventricle, let's say mouse rats, it's a trick. There are no real landmarks as you have in the left ventricle where you say aorta, apex. The right ventricle is there. So you have to adapt. So you could adapt as in, in that paper and we, we've had uh, Bill present also here in the in Nature Methods. Pulmonary artery flow, tough set for right ventricular function. You could do tricuspid flow as well. And here they looked into uh, right ventricular diameter. It's nature medicine, so it's true. I do prefer a modified long axis for looking at the diameter, but that's me. Um, I've tried. This is a really tricky one. Once they are, the right ventricle is big, not an issue. But we've had to talk before, as at baseline, you need to do the healthy state as well. So that's why I prefer a different view. But you can do a lot on the right ventricle without knowing the exact geometry. You can look into pulmonary artery uh, hypertension. Again, look in the pulmonary artery, look in acceleration <coughs> or acceleration to ejection time to normalize for heart rates. And it will match what you will get with invasive measurement of, uh, with a catheter. <coughs> Excuse me, with a catheter. Um, and if you look at pulmonary hypertension with ultrasound, Doppler, but also the beam of measurement, it will match what you get with uh, MRI or with pressure catheters or ex vivo. That's the whole idea. So, but what, this helps because you don't have the geomet 
the geometry of the right vertigo. Um, mentioned hypertrophy, the right ventricle, and there are left ventricular diseases where geometric assumptions stretch the border of reproducibility. Let's put it that way. Specifically thinking about myocardial infarction. So, the open animal, either permanently or temporarily, close the LAD, stop there for the blood flow, the coronary flow, and you induce an infarction. The infarction itself will vary in size because the coronary branches are pretty random. Even you have your scanning window, you count the ribs, you open up, and you, you close the LAD. So having a short axis view for looking at cardiac function, systolic function for an infarction model could be a bit ambitious. I personally prefer a long axis view or combining multiple short axis or long axis short axis, but a simple short axis M mode as requested by some referees, be careful there. And this is not me saying it. Um, 2016, the ESC put in the guidelines that for um, diagnosis and treatment of acute and chronic heart failure, the Tycholtz formula has inaccuracies and it's not recommended. It's quite a strong statement. Possible five ten Simpsons do two D echocardiography. If you can take it further, three dimensional echocardiography or cardiac MRI imaging, so three D four D approaches. The end formula remains the same. You still take the largest diastolic, sorry, di end diastolic volume, the end systolic volume, the difference divided by the diastolic will and give you the ejection fraction. The question is, how are these volumes determined and calculated? Where is the information coming from? So, now on the left side you see a healthy mouse heart, on the right side you see, admittedly, a severe infarction. Uh, you see the base going nuts trying to pump some blood out, whereas here there's absolutely little to no motion. Here the apical means in the apical region. <coughs> Torsion and twist that you can see in the 4D, the papillar muscles are nice and thick. Here the papillaries are extremely big, very little motion. So now at the, at the apex, and there was almost no torsion and twist. With one imaging session, you get all of this information. So the M mode itself may give you, let's say, an injection fraction of maybe 10%, because midventricular is almost no motion. Here you can do a bit more, meaning more meaning being more precise, as precise as an MRI system. In that case, a seven Tesla MRI. It's a, more of a manual approach. This was before the 4D technology was available. But comparing, and the baseline is now an MRI, golden standard. If it matches the zero line, then it's as good as MRI. And the 4D really fits the envelope, whereas 2D, 4D M mode, the one dimension, induces a bit wider spread of data. That's in that experimental setting, again, it depends on this substrain, how big the infarction is, how these will vary. But with less geometric or no geometric assumption, you really increase uh, the reliability of your data. For mouse, but also for rats, a comparison, MRI versus 4D, this is a hypertrophy model, uh, tucked in sham, looking at the volume over time of the various heartbeats. So, a lot can be done, and for hypertrophy, I have this one as well. Seven Tesla MRI. These are the images that I'm familiar with. The reconstruction, you do see glitches. Uh, that's, a, that's usually the step size. Uh, the MRI can do a lot, even better images, but then the acquisition may take a little bit longer time. But again, the, these images here with the reconstruction are the, considered golden standard at the baseline, and that's the 4D with the reconstruction that is matched to it. So very nice, clear uh, correlation. With 4D, sometimes you have scar tissue in the ultrasound, sternum, shadows, can be trouble with analyzing. So what we're trying now is to give you something that looks like an MRI. This is done by injecting a tiny little bit of contrast agent. You really only need a little bit, no contrast mode, no additional software or hardware, you do a regular exam, just get a little bit of contrast agent in for the 4D scan, and you can clearly see the ventricular lumen, now white instead of black, 
and the myocardial tissue. And in addition, it's a lot easier to look at the right ventricle. You will still have some shadows of kitchen elect here, it's a rib shadows. Um, now looking from the drop, top and cropping in left ventricle, septum, right ventricle, and allowing you to just increase reproducibility even further in case you are uh, struggling with, uh, with some shadows. Um, so systolic function, but we've also talked a bit about strain. And the question is like, okay, why bother? Why do strain? Why do the spatial track? Can you look at wall motion over time? It's a very nice paper uh, from 2016, and they found that global longitudinal strain and that term was mentioned quite a lot in the past two days, um, more sensitive than the systolic function. This is a clinical paper, by the way. So, of course, you can do strain analysis also in small animals. This is now mouse, severe infarction, health infarction. I just took the as day and night as it gets. Uh, but the key for strain analysis is that you can see the subtle differences. So not like really sick and absolutely healthy, but what's happening in between and when it's happening in between. All this data, velocity, displacement, strains of tissue deformation, deformation over time, the strain rate, can also be nicely illustrated uh, in a 3D. Basically, in what you can see here is uh, no blue, it's fibroblast injection into the uh, infarction area and here induced pluripotent stem cells. And to see that over time, the stem cells help in repair. You don't need to read a lot on the manuscript. If you look at this, it's like, okay, this looks like the start. Here it doesn't. People will understand what you're trying to tell. Mouse, you can take it a lot, not smaller. You can look at zebrafish tip. As long as you have a nice tracing, you will, <coughs> excuse me, you will see the tissue repair. In that case, it's, uh, it's now uh, 60 days post cry injury, and then over time, the heart will start to increase uh, in its pumping abilities. Now, the 4D, I've talked about 4D for systolic function. You get the volumes, no assumptions. But once you have a 4D data set, there's a lot more that could be done a little bit later on that's maybe not at a focus right now. Some more po post-processing, for example, like 4D strain on a mouse heart. This is something um, a group of, uh, of Boyle developed. They used uh, vivo data and created their own model. So this is not something that is commercially available at this point in time. But this group, I can really recommend. Uh, it's a very technical read. Um, I give up after the abstract and the pictures. But um, they are looking for collaborations. So if you have data sets, you have questions, they are happy to collaborate on that to push 4D strain further. What we're also looking at right now is something that hadn't been done before, wasn't considered possible, but how about looking at the infarction size in vivo, non-invasively, and randomize your animal based on how big your myocardial infarction is. So there's no paper right there, out, right out there. We have uh, some, groups, uh, some groups looking into this as a little bit of a side project, because it's, it's so new, it's not, we, we're, we're getting there. Um, well, that could be quite cool. And with the of contrast agent, it may even help a little bit more, because you see also the different contrast within the tissue, because contrast agent needs functional vascularity to reach there. So that could be an option. Um, something more to be done, um, I'll put this in a little bit of future developments, is to look into oxygenation. I mean, you have infarction or ischemia reperfusion. So what's the level? What's happening to the heart before you, let's say, open up uh, the LED again? And that you can do by combining ultrasound with optical imaging, basically sending laser light into the tissue. And here's a heat map. The more from the black, blue to the red you go, as you can see here, the more the oxygenation. What is detected is the hemoglobin and differentiating whether the hemoglobin has oxygen bound to it or not. 
And it's a very uh, proof of concept, uh, this uh, paper from, from last year, looking into myocardial infarction and looking at the atrial regions, how the oxygenation drops. <clears throat> so it's a work in progress, but um, if you tell me this is completely nonsense, we stop developing it. If you think, if you tell me like, that could be really something, we'll dig a little bit more. So I'm looking forward to your feedback. Um, besides that, um, we've talked about oncology a little bit and the toxic toxicity um, for the uh, anti-cancer drugs. And I, I, I like to show this slide because, well, first of all, cardio, cardiology and oncology have a lot in common. At least if you're oncology, you definitely need to look at the heart. Um, they have a lot in common in terms of hard and soft, and what to analyze, but also in terms of what is usually presented. Many papers show ejection fraction. It's improving, the treatment is working, which is absolutely relevant on a patient setting because you need to take, tell the patient you're good or you're not so good. In the preclinical studies, you don't necessarily do that. You make the conclusion, you draw the conclusion on the group level. So not the individual level. And ejection fraction itself may be the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot more to it. Look at oxygenation, true volumetric quantification. So how is the ejection fraction actually calculated? Never forget the diastolic function, including the tissue doctor. Spectral tracking. Also, you do ultrasound. You have the physiological recording. There's the ECG. Analyze the ECG. PQRS, what's the RR interval? What, what's happening in there? All of that can be done, and all of that can also be applied to the tumors when people report the tumor volume shrinks. Yeah, that's great, but what else is happening? So it's a big overlap. So the question is, what should one look at? At a combination of parameters or a single parameter? And I get a widespread of replies. It's like, oh, I have this one parameter. I run them all. That one shows the asterisk and significance, so that's the one I report. So bottom line for, for this, I would say, is that when you look at the heart, it's a complex organ. The whole is more than the sum of its parts. So it's a combination of different parameters to see if something is well or something is not working so well. Um, <coughs> last but not least, um, for standardization, standardization through education. So, Please help me learn, educate me of what I should include or what I should skip. Um, it's recorded, so it's a little late, but um, please help me. And also, if you already have a Vivo system, I hope you're familiar with the learning hubs. We have all the imaging guides in paper, but we've also got training videos showing anything on animal preparation, what you need to take care of, what you need to take care of in image acquisition, how to analyze the data, including 3D and 4D, all of these videos are followed by an examination. So having it run in the background is an option, but you will have to pass the exam. Um, just to really help. Um, education is a two-way street. This is our version, and I'm sure that we will find things that you do differently and with, with reason. But we are heavily, as a company, heavily relying on you to be educated. So that you educate us. And a way of helping that way is the travel awards. You go to conferences, you present data, uh, please let us know. You basically copy paste your abstract, tell us what the Vivo technology did as part of the work, so it doesn't need to be an ultrasound centric paper. Um, because this is how we as a company learn what's new, what's happening in the field, and what we may be struggling with. And by the way, this is a conference, you submit an abstract, it counts. So just have a look, it's, uh, there's no travel period, it's just that we need to have certain deadlines in the year, and you, you submit. We call it travel award, what you do with the funds is yours. So bottom line to sum up, the heart is at the center of things. A lot can be done in terms of standardization and the technology allows actually to have this conversation in the first place. And with that, I hope you have a lot of questions. Thank you.